Our next presenter is Ross Ben. He is a student of history, mystery, and prophecy, and shares what he learns freely in service to humanity. Ross Ben is also a self-published author and has recently released Rocks of Ages, a new edition. Rocks of Ages is a cultur culturally centered survey of therapeutic use of crystals and sacred stones and explores the importance of utilizing them in these prophetic times. Ross Ben gave one of the most groundbreaking lectures at the last Free Your Mind conference, Free Your Mound conference. <laughs> and we got so many people out there contacting us about it, and I'm sure he did as well. And I can only imagine what Ross is going to bring to the table. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross Ben. Yes, yes I. Blessed love to everyone. I want to open by uh, giving love, thanks, honor, and respect to that omniversal awareness. It's known by many names, many people. We got to give thanks for that life, health, and strength, knowledge, wise mind, and understanding, our faith, love, and charity, and our food, clothing, and shelter. We want to honor the ancestors that are with us, the remembered and the forgotten, the mothers of the mothers, the fathers of the fathers, elders who are with us. We give thanks for your presence. We give thanks for your example of how to live and the resource of wisdom that you share. And with your permission, we will begin. Give thanks. And I do want to shout out the uh, Free Your Mind team. Uh, the last conference was, I, I called it the Blow Your Mind. <laughs> you know, because uh, I just learned so much. It was, you know, it was mind blowing. And, and uh, the tradition is continuing this time. I'm, I'm, I'm honored, it's an honor to be given the mic in the midst of uh, who, who's been sharing, you know? So I'm very thankful, and, and uh, the feedback and anticipation uh, is very appreciated, and I hope, I hope to, uh, you know, I hope to, to, to come like I did last time and, 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 and help blow y'all mind a little bit, you know? Right. So our focus, Today is uh, Philadelphia, Ben Franklin, and the Gates of Hell. And I actually came across this information kind of an uh, indirect way. Uh, came across it uh, research, doing some research on the star nations and crop circles, particularly this crop circle right here, which many consider to be the second most important crop circle ever. Because those who study crop circles, like 99.9% .9 of crop circles, are expressions of sacred geometry and divine mathematics, right? But sometimes the star nations will drop a crop circle that has symbolism really human, you know? Like sacred geometry, that's omniversal. Divine mathematics, that's omniversal, you know? But uh, sometimes they'll drop a crop circle. The symbol, like when you decode it, the symbols, they're, they're very relative to our experience. And this was one of them, all right? Because what you have here is a reptoid beam being projected in lines of resolution. Right? And then you have a CD-ROM, a CD, that has a binary, binary code etched into it. All right? And so this, uh, this reptoid beam with the lines of resolution, that's really speaking to 
a cult classic film. They live, you know, John Carpenter, where he shared with us that there's some humanoid, some other type of oid entities, <laughs> right, that are controlling how people think through television, right? But it's this, uh, it was the message on the disc that really set off this research about what I'm going to talk about today. Because uh, there was a researcher who took a picture of this crop circle, took it in, studied the binary code, and realized, oh, this will translate into the ASCII keys, ASCII code, you know, which is the binary equivalent to the alphabet on the keyboard, right? So when he translated it, you got a message in English. I'm going to read the. I'm going to read it just as it was, and then I'm going, I'm going to kind of fill in the blanks. But the message read: "Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception. Conduit closing." That was how the message read. I'm going to kind of fill in the blanks how I feel, right? Beware the reptilian, and that comes in, this is this, is this face, this is a reptoid, humanoid face. Beware the reptilian bearers of false gifts, which is technology, this CD and this television, right? Beware the bearers of false gifts, technology, and their broken promises. Humanity is in much pain, but there is still time to heal. <coughs> Believe there is good out there in outer space. We oppose deception, and the deceiver's conduit is closing. So this is the message, right? And this, this uh, I should have said, this crop circle was dropped August 15th in 2002. So it's old, it's 12 13 years old. But uh, the question, the question, the question that was plaguing my mind, what is the conduit? What is the conduit? And yeah, like, when is it closing? Let's wrap this thing up, you know? So that's what kind of put me on this information trying to answer the question, what is the conduit? And what I found out is that Philadelphia is a conduit, specifically uh, a very large conduit. You can even call it a gate of hell. And it was opened by Ben Franklin. So that's what we're going to get into today. All right? And uh, these are two the, the mystery of all of this is on the Ben Franklin Parkway, which is a very deep place. I know no, local Philadelphians know that. If you're visiting this region, you definitely want to go and see this place and check it out because it's deep. We talk about things hidden in plain sight. It, it doesn't get too much deeper, you know? And... Uh, yeah, let's get into why. So, to get into the, 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 the uh, specific details of the Ben Franklin Parkway, we really got to break down the mystery of the entire parkway. And the mystery of the Ben Franklin Parkway reveals three important things. The first is that this country, United States, is a resurrection of Rome, okay? And that France and England, both overtly and covertly, worked to bring about this resurrection of Rome. And when France and England had to work covertly, Ben Franklin 
was the point man, the mastermind, the go-to man that orchestrated those covert works. All right, so what, what actually did Ben Franklin do covertly? Uh, you could call him the French Connection in the Seven Year War, also known as the French and Indian War. It occurred between 1754 and 1763, and it was basically the mastermind, divide, and conquer strategy that opened up this continent to Rome. Okay? And he did that starting in 1754 in the Albany Congress, where he met with British and the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois Nation. And at this time, the Iroquois Nation, the Haudenosaunee, Iroquois is like a misnomer. It's a French derogatory term of the Haudenosaunee. It means venomous serpents, because they said they were kind of deceptive, right? Or portray them as deceptive. So the Haudenosaunee were in battle with the French. The French were coming down through Canada, engaging the Haudenosaunee in battle. Meanwhile, the Lenape here in these regions were in battle against the English, the Lenape, were, who were historically enemies with the Haudenosaunee, but they approached them. I said, look, help us. We, got, we, have, we, we were enemies in the past, but we got a common enemy. Help us expel the British. Ben Franklin negotiated with the Haudenosaunee and said, look, I know the French are harassing y'all from Canada. If you don't align with the Lenape, we the British will help you against the French. The Haudenosaunee agreed to that, left the Lenape to fight the British alone, and eventually got expelled through uh, the Treaty of Easton, a couple of other manipulative moves that got expelled west of the Alleghenies. But then, in 1763, Franklin betrayed the Haudenosaunee by signing the Treaty of Paris, which more or less France agreed to give England all of quote unquote New France. And that included the Haudenosaunee territory. So, Frank, because what, how, how did that happen? Because Franklin was the French connection. He negotiated both of these treaties and he was working with both of the European nations. And again, the intention ultimately was about resurrecting Rome. Y'all with me? Oh, yeah. All right. So, how is this French connection memorialized on the Ben Franklin Parkway? Well, the parkway itself is modeled after the Champs, excuse my French, as they say, the Champs Elysees of Paris, okay? This is Logan Circle. Anyone who knows the original layout of Philadelphia, Philadelphia had four squares, Rittenhouse Square, Washington Square, Franklin Square, but this was supposed to be the fourth circle, Logan Square, but they made it a circle to model it after the Shams and the A's, saying like, yeah, Ben Franklin Parkway, Ben Franklin is the French Connection. French Connection is memorialized also. Uh, this is like some of the deeper mysteries of the parkway. Franklin, the secrets, of, he was in a French 
secret society, a French order. It was called the Order of the Nine Sisters. Okay? Got in it in 1776. This was the French order that Franklin worked through to get support for the quote unquote uh, War of Independence. Okay? And uh, Franklin eventually became a Grand Master of the Order of the Nine Sisters. Okay? But how is this memorialized on the Ben Franklin Parkway? The emblem of the Nine Sisters is nine sisters on a temple that's on a mound, right? Anyone that knows the Ben Franklin Parkway knows that the Philadelphia Museum of Art is not only designed to be a museum, but a temple to the muses. And the muses are the nine sisters of music, art, culture, beauty, right? And it sits on top of the most sacred mound, earth mound of the Lenape, which we know today as Fair Mount, right? But this temple to the muses is memorializing Franklin's initiation into the Order of the Nine Sisters. And it's, you know, another reaffirmation of that French connection that we talked about. Franklin being the covert operative for the French. More French connection, memorializing the architecture of, on the parkway, the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Municipal Courts. This is Parisian architecture that is uh, twin buildings that replicate the twin palaces on the Place de la Concorde, okay? But now we also talk about ultimately this thing being a resurrection of Rome, right? Kind of building on what Brother Stars was talking about, right? That this, this thing, right, we're dealing with it in 2015, but this is an ancient thing. You know, that beast has seven heads, right? It resurrects that's the, them seven heads of these sef, seven nations that this beast system reincarnates through, right? So Rome resurrected is memorialized several ways on the Ben Franklin Parkway. One is the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul, right? It's the architecture of Renaissance Italy, and it has a Vatican presence. The Franklin Institute, Imperial Roman architecture, okay? The Philadelphia Museum of Art, we know Rome was founded by the refugees of the Trojan War, Aeneas and the Aeneids. And so Rome sees Greece as its cultural roots. So the cultural roots of Rome is memorialized in the Greek temple of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. City Hall represents Rome's modern future. Okay? Rome as the modern metropolis Mystery Babylon. So we said uh, Franklin was this French connection. He was hooked up with the Order of the Nine Sisters. The Order of the Nine Sisters, they are responsible for many museums. When you see a museum, it's got a creepy vibe. It ain't just like, you know, like the Wagner Institute or just, you know, Right, it's a museum, it's got, you know, it's like, yo, there's something up with that, right? It was, it's probably founded by the Order of Nine Sisters. So, they built another museum on the Ben Franklin Parkway, okay, to memorialize Franklin's England-British Freemason connection, okay? And 
That museum is the Rodin Museum. We're going to get into that one. It's, 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 it's deep. But it memorial, the Rodin Museum memorializes Ben Franklin's membership in the Hellfire Club, also known as the Freemason Lodge of England. Uh, he was inducted into it in 1757. Hellfire Club was founded by 17, in 1722 by Philip Duke of Wharton. And this dude was just a, he was a out of the closet Satanist. He was an overt Satanist. In the guise of mocking religions, he would have black masses and, you know, sacrifice and all kinds of wild things to the point where they had to, those who were still in power, they kind of had to disassociate themselves with Philip Award. That's why they changed the name of the organization from the Hellfire Club to the Grand Freemason Lodge of England, right? And they even had to kind of like disassociate Philip Award, but we still know what they were dealing with because Franklin's home in England. They excavated it in 1998. What did they find in the basement? Tell us. Ten bodies, women and children. Right? So a lot, so, right. Revisionist historians and, you know, the deceivers, right? They were like, yeah, Franklin wasn't, he studied medicine. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. He, the, he was, uh, the, these were some cadavers he was researching. <laughs> believe what you want to believe, but we know what we know. Right? So, how did the Order of the Nine Sisters memorialize Ben Franklin's connection to the Hellfire Club. They built the Rodin Museum. And it's a Parisian style museum, but for real it looks like a mausoleum. And when you study it, it's as much underground as it is above ground. And it has a permanent installment that's called the Gates of Hell. Can't make this up. <laughs> you can't make this up. All right. And the gates of hell are. It's a series. It's a permanent installment. It's not one thing. It's a. It's a Rodin is a sculpture. Gates of hell is a sculpture, but it's. Uh, it's got several sculptures that are a part of this theme of the gates of hell, and. The uh, thinker, this is the most iconographic sculpture there is. If you just say, visualize the sculpture in your mind right now. <laughs> most people are going to come up with the thinker. How many people knew that this sat on the Ben Franklin Parkway and was part of an installation called the Gates of Hell? <laughs> how, did, how, who knew that? Okay, it's right there on, this sits on the parkway. It's not even in the Rodin Museum. Okay. And this is actually the gate of hell. And what I want you to notice is that the thinker, right, here the thinker sits on the parkway, but then there's a miniature thinker on the gate of hell also. So what does that say? That the gates of hell is a projection, it's a mental projection of this thinker. We all know the science of posture too. Let's, 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 let's analyze this a little bit because we know the science of posture, right? That if, we, if, we, if we're in a, we want to be connected, right? Our spine has to be straight, 
shoulder square, nothing crossed. Am I right? Look at this dude. Look how he's sitting. He's contorted. His posture's horrible. So what is he conjuring? What is he thinking? We're going to find out. <laughs> but we do want to see that his, uh, his, this gate of hell is a projection of the thinker. Right? And this is so right. It's uh, the, the, the gates of hell, the gate of hell is a depiction of the torments of the hells that are experienced by souls in Dante's Divine Comedy. And uh, it's the second hell specifically. And so this is some uh, close-ups that we see on the gates of hell. You see it's just pure torment and sufferation. Right? Torment and suffering. People eating people. People like entangled in conflict and losing their minds, you know? It's just torment is hell. So how do we get there? That's what the other art in the installation shows us. Rome antics. Antics of Rome. Politics. Conspiracy. You know? We know the politics. We know how, to, how they do, right? In, in those Roman, uh, like the capital which is Roman architecture and all the antics that goes on. This is, it's not new. It's an ancient, ancient thing. How else do we get there? Mutual consecration. You see their hands, three men, their hands are all in the same cookie pot, cookie jar, mutual consecration, taking oaths. And, they're in, they're, and, and there's shame and guilt associated with these oaths. Their heads are down and to the side. Shame and guilt. So how they have those rituals. You want to join the club, you got to do something shameful. Something nasty. Right? This is how you, this is how you get into this gate of hell. Guilt and shame. Guilt and shame, imbalance, and of course, misplaced sexual desire. So these are the themes that you see in the other work by Rodin that is a part of this installation, The Gate of Hell. So then the question is why? Why, why, why put a gate of hell with the thinker on the Ben Franklin Parkway? What, what does this have? We know Ben Franklin was in the Hellfire Club, but it's, it's gotta be deeper significance, right? And the reason is, is that Ben Franklin is the thinker raised hell for the Hellfire Club of England. And he did so by birthing the United States at 2.13 a.m. July 4th, 1776, giving the United States a 7.5 degree Gemini rising. Okay? And so we've got, got to get into a little astrology here, all right, and talk about the birth, we, every, the, 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 the birthday of the U.S. is kind of given, July 4th, 1776. But there's an eternal debate, it's not going to stop here. 
there's an eternal debate about what time was the U.S. born and thus what is the real chart of the United States, right? So a lot of people go with the Scorpio rising chart, which they get from when you look on the back of the $100 bill and you see there's an artistic depiction of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. If you look at the clock at Independence Hall, on that depiction it's at 2.21 p.m. So if you cast a chart for that time, you get a Scorpio rising, eight degrees Scorpio, right? That kind of fits because the eagle is the emblem of the U.S. Eagle is associated with uh, Scorpio. And we said this is a resurrection of Rome. Scorpio deals with resurrection, right? So, okay, we can, we can be both and. It don't have to be either or. We can see some relevance in that. There's also the Hancock chart based on John Hancock's uh, account of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and his role as uh, Philadelphia, as, as, as someone working for the Philadelphia Historical Society. And based on his account, some people give the U.S. A, a, a 510 birth time, which gives the United States a 12 degree Sagittarius rising. I think that's the projection. That's what, you know, the whole idea that this is the United States is the moral authority for the world, right? How uh, William Penn said Pennsylvania, his colony was going to be an example for the nation. Example for the world, example of the nations. That's, that's what the United States want to see itself as, right? But I, I, along with a lot of other astrologers, feel the chart that best fits the United States, when you look at it natally, transit, and progress, meaning, okay, United States enters World War I, which chart is getting activated? United States, the Civil War, which chart, did, you know, which, which chart is this reflected and activated the most? It's what they call the Franklin chart. And that chart is cast for 2.13 in the morning. Who heard that there was a, like some works with Ben Franklin that he was obsessed with having some signage of the Declaration of Independence occur in those early morning hours? Anybody heard that tradition? Okay, we got a couple. So yeah, research this. It's called the Franklin chart, 2.13 a.m. Let's look at this chart real quick. Just, just enough to see, like, wow, this thing really does fit. We can start with the three beneficence. There's three beneficence in astrology. Sun, Jupiter, Venus. All three are in the second house, house of abundance. This is the most abundant nation, I don't know if I say ever, but that we know of, richest nation in the world. You got Uranus in the first house conjuncting the ascendant. Most modern tech, Uranus is the bringer of technology, false gifts. We're going to get into that. But how most modern inventions, most modern technologies, industrial revolution, this country was the jump off. The United States is born with Mercury retrograde. Okay? In Cancer, in the third house. So this is this perception, like, you know, if we want to be honest with ourselves, how this nation perceives itself on the world stage is kind of, it's off. 
you know? Champions of freedom, but we deal with a lot of bondage, and it's, you know, our defense department conducts a lot of war, you know? <laughs> uh, that's that, because it's Mercury retrograde. We don't, we don't see ourselves how we really are. Need a, what do you say? Respect means to look again? Yeah, we're not, we don't look again. Okay? Got Neptune and Virgo in the fifth house. This whole industrial, agriculture, pesticide, GMO, here it is. Also Hollywood. <laughs> okay? All of this is, is in this Franklin chart. Saturn, Libra, fifth house, the destroyer of the nuclear family. And right, the synchronicities and how the different presentations, the information coincides like it's, yeah, because I, 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 I heard all these themes from a lot of different presenters, right? Pluto. In Cap in Ninth House, United States is having its Pluto return. All right, but yeah, this international domination. Moon high in the chart in Aquarius. We love our freedom. We have Aquarian ideals, right? Oh, and I left out one: Mars in First House and Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly at war, constantly in search of enemies. Okay, but uh, yes, but we mentioned like why why are we really focusing on this chart? The significance is right here. This rising. What was on the rising? We live in the West, where what you see is what you get. Seeing is believing, right? That's why in Western astrology, the sun is given prominence because the sun is the illuminator. The sun is what reveals, right? But when you want to get to the essence of something and you're looking at astrology, you look at the rising. Because they say all souls enter the earth plane from the eastern horizon. Whatever's on the eastern horizon at the time of birth, that's what's incarnating. Are y'all with me? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, seven and a half degrees Gemini was on the rising at the birth of the United States because of Ben Franklin. I should have backed up too because, right. So what happened was, I'm discerning is that Franklin got Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Charles Thompson, who is the Samuel Adams of Philadelphia, a very important person that we have to research. He designed the seal of the U.S., and he was the secretary of the... Continental Congress, so he's the one who actually wrote the Declaration. Okay? These four got together and did some signage at 2.13 a.m. And that's what sealed the seven and a half degree Gemini rising. So now, you know, we look like if we needed to calculate that today, we could do it in a computer pushing a button. If we had to do it 100 years ago, we could look up an ephemeris, right, where they had calculated and plotted uh, the times of what's on the horizon, right? <coughs> ben Franklin didn't have any of those. He probably used a telescope that was given to him by the, by the order of the first Rosicrucians to come to this country, known historically as the Hermits of the Ridge. They lived in caves in the Wissahickon, uh, Wissahickon Fairmount Park, 
right? Which is a very significant land. And uh, it's a, I'll tell you why it's significant. It's significant because it's a Pangean microcontinent. It's a piece of Pangea that never submerged through continental uh, tectonic plate movement. Okay? And they lived in caves in this, uh, in the Wissahickon Valley. The, uh, they were a celibate order that wasn't accustomed to the environment. So they died off. Right? But the, one of the last of the hermits, a man named Christopher Witt, he's known historically because he painted the first oil portrait in the United States. And it was of that the first oil portrait was of the founder of the Hermits of the Ridge, Johann Kelp, also known as Johannes Kelpius. Uh, but when Christopher Witt, the, the rest of the order had died off, Christopher Witt was the last man standing and one of the last things he did was give all their scientific instrumentation to Ben Franklin. And more than likely, Ben Franklin used their telescope to get a, a eye visual of when this gates of hell would be coming on the eastern horizon. And the star that he was looking for, and that's what, like the synchronicities is mind blowing. The star that he was looking for is Aldebaran. Wow. And isn't that the star the brother mentioned yesterday? Yeah. As where these invading entities is coming from, right? Yeah. Bang, check this. So, Aldebaran is Arabic for the eye of the bull. So when we say, Bam, he hit the bullseye. Wow. Franklin hit the bullseye in founding this nation and opened up the gates of hell. He waited until Aldebaran was on the, or on the rising. And remember, all souls come to the earth plain from where? The eastern horizon. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So why is seven and a half degrees Gemini the gate of hell? And it has to do with what, what you would call our galactic orientation. All right? Because that's really what the zodiac or the zoodix does. It tells us where, where are we oriented in our galaxy. We know, start, we, know we live in an omniverse, right? that's full of stars, but stars aren't just randomly distributed. They're in communities called galaxies, right? And galaxies tend to have a core or a center and a periphery, right? So we are, galactically speaking, we are closer to outer darkness. We are closer to the periphery of our galaxy than we are to the center. Okay, we're about 26,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. If I wanted to look to the center of our galaxy, I, I want to look into the constellation Sagittarius. Okay, so our galactic center, because we're so far away, we perceive it as a point of light. Even though if we were to get up on it, it's like thousands and thousands and thousands of stars there, as well as a super massive black star. They call them black holes, but it's really a black star. But we see it as a point of light, and it's at 26 degrees Sagittarius. We call that point of light Sagittarius A. Okay? When we look at the constellation Gemini, we're looking in the direction of what's called outer darkness, which is the omniverse outside of our galactic community. Y'all with me? All right, now there's this other phenomenon 
in astrology that's called the 16th harmonic, right? <coughs> Which says every 22, they say that there's 16 galactic portals, 16 points in the zodiac where the energy from the galactic core, the energy from the galactic community is like even stronger than the sun or the moon or whatever other local celestial influences we have. Y'all with me? All right, so those, so that's uh, every zero and 22 and a half degrees of your cardinal sign. <laughs> Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn. So zero degrees, Aries. 22 and a half degrees, Aries. Galactic portal. And, and that way for all the cardinals. 15 degrees of each fixed sign. So 15 degrees Taurus, 15 degrees Leo, 15 degrees Scorpio, 15 degrees Aquarius. Galactic portal. Then you have seven and a half degrees of all of the mutable signs. Seven and a half degrees Pisces, seven and a half degrees Virgo, seven and a half degrees Sag, seven and a half degrees Gemini. Galactic portals, y'all with me? Yeah. You said the galactic core is in Sagittarius. So the galactic portal of Sagittarius, seven and a half degrees Sagittarius. <coughs> Very important. It is considered astrologically to be the gate of heaven. It is the portal that you would use to get to the galactic core, which we will call the seventh heaven, the highest region in heaven. All right? Uh, so now, if I'm at the gate of heaven, seven and a half degrees Sag, and I make a 180 degree turn, I'm at seven and a half degrees Gemini. And that's really the portal to outer darkness. It's the portal to the omniverse outside of our galactic community. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And that is why seven and a half degrees Gemini is the gate of hell. Okay, the gate of outer darkness. But now, there was something else happening in the chart that Franklin tapped. So not only did he open up the gate of hell, but the planet Uranus was right on the ascendant when he was tapping it. And I mentioned this, Uranus astrologically rules all things modern, all things electronic, all things technological. Okay, and so how this nation is really associated, like you think about, you think about the pace of life before the United States. How long it took to travel, how long it took to communicate, you think about where we are now. You see the impact of the United States being born with Uranus at the gates of hell and being given these false gifts, which is technology. Okay? And uh, I'm going to say, like, we're not going to focus on all technologies. But the significant technologies that were discovered in Philadelphia, we could say were false gifts. Because to us, it was like, oh, you helping us, you know, have light in the, in the house, and you helping us uh, uh, be able to, I could go on Facebook and, you know, <laughs> right? But these technologies were given by entities so that we would blow open the gates of hell for them. Y'all with me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. But 
before I get all into that, I want to say that Franklin tapping this is memorialized on the Ben Franklin Parkway by the Franklin Institute of Science and Invention. Okay? And yeah, remember, like this, this, this thing is sick, like, you know, we opened up. The message was, what? Beware the bearers of these false gifts, which is technology. So they telling us, like, yeah, watch, you, you know, it's a false gift. And the three things we're going to look at is electricity, computer, time travel. All discovered where? Philadelphia. And who is credited with the quote unquote discovering electricity? Ben Franklin. Okay? And this is memorialized in Franklin Square. There's a giant key and lightning bolt, right? But now, when you read, this is deep because, see, they even kind of spun this out a little bit, all right? That Franklin was, was re Franklin was definitely researching the phenomena of lightning to determine was it the same as electricity, right? But it wasn't with a key and kite how they're playing it. Because when you read his account, it sounds like he was dealing with what Tesla was dealing with. Listen to this. The Philadelphia experiment for drawing the electric fire from clouds by means of pointed rods of iron erected on high buildings. So it wasn't like just fly a kite in and is the lightning going to strike the key? No. <laughs> Tesla was about that free energy. creating buildings that can tap the electric potential of the earth and just have a free, elect free source of electricity. It sounds like what Franklin was dealing with. Okay? So, right, that's over 200 years ago. How long has this free energy technology been suppressed? That's what we say. It's, that's how we know it's false gifts. Because... They're not, it's not even coming for our benefit, you know, the collective benefit. It is said, you know, the computer was quote unquote discovered at the University of Pennsylvania, right in Philadelphia, <laughs> right in West Philly. It said that Jean von Neumann, and I get this information from Peter Moon Montauk, uh, Montauk series, okay? John von Neumann created ENIAC. Again, not so we could go on Facebook, right? And uh, eBay and all of that. He created it because they had to do some serious mathematics to calibrate the generators to be used on the USS Eldridge for the Philadelphia experiment. So the, the, the computer is a, what, an outcrop a byproduct of the Philadelphia experiment. How many people knew that? And then we have to talk about the quote unquote the Philadelphia experiment, okay? Where they had Tesla coils, generators that were calibrated by John von Neumann using ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania and they did all this to test Einstein, Einstein's theory of relativity, okay? And the thing was, it was a catastrophic success. It was a catastrophic success because, yes, they, now, they say they were attempting to achieve radar invisibility. Germans were blowing up all of the ships going across the Atlantic. And they needed a technology that would make the ships radar invisible. But when they fired up 
the generators and, and, and the coils, the ship also, yeah, it went invisible because it dropped out of this timeline. They blew open a hole in the space-time continuum. And when it did eventually, eventually rematerialize, because everything had energized, when it rematerialized, the crew members and the ships and a lot of places had fused together. A lot of the people who were on the ship, if they didn't get fused, they lost their mind. Because they were, dis they were disconnected from their natal timeline. So when they came, just because they were brought back to this timeline, their orientation to 3D linear space time was completely distorted, you know? <coughs> so this, this made me think a little more when I, when I, when I saw this uh, Philadelphia Experiment connection. I, 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 it, 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 I, I started thinking, is this why Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State? Okay? Because Keystone, the, Philadelphia and Stonehenge share a ley line. Okay? And why that's relevant is because According to Peter Moon and the Montauk series, right, what was happening in Stonehenge at the exact same time of the Philadelphia Experiment? Aleister Crowley was up there doing his most dramatic <coughs> sex massacre ritual ever. Okay, so I thinking about this gate of hell, right? Stone. You think of a of a gate or a door. It's got two moving parts: a hinge and a key. Am I right? So stone hinge, keystone, gates of hell, maybe a connection. <laughs> All right, but now even with Montauk, because we know John von Neumann didn't stop in 1943, that he continued his research, Montauk, New York, and in 1983 they did the same thing, opened up a big hole in space time. So you got a 40 year, a 40 year time span. And this, this is mystic, okay? Where the Philadelphia experiment occurred was right below the beginning of the 40th parallel. And Montauk is right above the 40th parallel. So I, I think that there is a hole in the fabric of space-time that spans the four, uh, spatially, it spans the 40th parallel from Philadelphia up through Montauk. Chronistically, it's a 40-year hole. And that is the big, when you say conduit, remember, how do we get in, what is the conduit? That's the conduit. And what does this conduit allow the deceivers to do? It allows them to play with our time. So they can go to the future, see what it's supposed to be, and go back in the past and attempt to manipulate it. Okay? Fourth dimensional manipulation. That is, that's, that's the deeper levels of the conduit and the gates of hell. So again, they gave us these false gifts. 
the three significant ones discovered right here in Philadelphia. Electricity, computer, time travel. Blew open these holes in the space-time, in the fabric of space-time. And this is the conduit. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right, so now, uh, this is, this is, this is a deep, right, because when we say, all right, gates of hell, well, what is hell? Where is hell? We've heard, a, we've heard some discussion on this. So I'm going to share what I've, I've come across to add to, add to this, all right? Like, what is hell? Where is hell? And I think, geographically, the most significant region on earth that you would say like, yeah, this is, this is like a big portal of hell, or this is a big focal point of hell, is right here, which is really, it's in the heart of Africa, what they call Africa, okay? At the original zero, zero reference point on the globe, all right? So we know our, our, our current, Zero, zero reference point is defined by the Greenwich Meridian, right? And so if you follow Greenwich Meridian down to the equator, the original zero, zero is somewhere in the Atlantic. Excuse me, the current zero, zero is somewhere in the Atlantic, all right? But that, the Greenwich Meridian is, was not the original prime meridian. The original prime meridian is the degree of latitude that goes through the Giza complex. So if you take that original degree of latitude down to the equator, you get the original zero, zero reference point on the map, okay? And it's in a place that today is called Ruanzori, Mount Ruanzori. It's on the border of Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the most unhospitable places on planet Earth, okay? And uh, specifically within the Ruanzori Mountains, also known as the Mountains of the Moon, the specific point is a place called Mount Hoya, okay? Uh, I, I heard Brother Stars talking earlier, and, and because right, it was like, how do you talk? How do you source this in ancient scripture without sounding religious? It's not easy. <laughs> you know, it's not easy, right? But uh, I like the Ethiopian Book of Enoch. All right. We know, all right, and I, I, just real quick, why? If I'm telling a lie, I'm telling, the, I'm, I'm gonna tell the biggest lie ever told, right? What do I have to use? I gotta use the biggest truth. If I wanna tell the biggest lie ever told, I gotta use the biggest truth and, and distort it and twist it. So, I hope I'm not stepping on no toes. But if the Bible is the biggest lie, the book of Enoch is the biggest truth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, and the book of Enoch is geographical, scientific, astrological, astronomical, as much as it is theological. Okay? And in Enoch, they refer to this area as the cornerstone of the earth and a mountain whose point reaches the summit of heaven. I already mentioned why it's called the cornerstone of the earth, because it was the original zero, zero reference point, okay? As far as the mountain whose peak reaches the summit of the earth, we know the Himalayas are the tallest is the highest points above sea level, right? 
But when you account for the bulge, the equatorial bulge of the earth, the, the Ruwenzori Mountains are the highest point of the planet in relation to the heavens. So the summit of Ruwenzori touches the peak of the ionosphere. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So now, this place is actually, the, is actually the most powerful vortex on planet Earth. Meaning, the magnetic fields of the Earth is most charged, most energized, right here at this Ruanzori Mountains. It's the closest point to the ionosphere. It's the first part of the Earth that sun rays touch. Okay? And it's a, an important radio point for the magnetic fields of the Earth. You know, the, pole, the poles are the polar points for the magnetic fields. This is the radial points. Okay? <clears throat> so in Enoch, he was taken to a mountain, the point of whose summit reached the heaven. And there he saw those who were like flaming fire. And when they wished, they appeared like men. Yes. Right, so they were those like flaming fire that when they wished, one minute. Are you serious? Two minutes? Ah. Five minutes. All right. All right, so, uh, so, Uh, building on brother stars. There was a battle in the heavens, right? Enoch says, Mikael defeated those rebels of heaven and bound them <coughs> in the earth. And this is the place of the prison of the angels. All right? So, those fallen angels are imprisoned in the earth, and when they wish, they can appear as men. Okay? And that fire that's inside the earth, that's inside the core, it is this star seed consciousness of those disobedient ones from the heavens. Okay? And they manipulated nature, manipulated the elements took on bodies. These are what we know of as those reptilian beings, right? They don't have no natural ecosystem. So they don't have no natural food source. Our fear, our suffering, because we are star seeds. Consubstantiation, we're all made of the same substance. So the same soul fire in us is the same soul our energy, right? So they don't have a natural food source. We became their food source. Through them, you know, eating our souls. But they got to corrupt our souls with fear and suffering. They don't also, they don't have natural reproduction. So they got to steal our genetic materials to reproduce. They're known by many names, by many people. Right? The Nephilim, the Chitauli, the Draconians, Setians, the leader, Lucifer, Satan, known by many names. Kunji, Nangai, Shaitan, Enoch called him Azazel. They, they manipulated our gene pool, made it with some of us. These are these giants, these Nephilim. This is an ancient thing. It happened in the days of Jared, antediluvian. Okay? Where did the first spawning occur? Right here. Okay, the summit whose point reached the heaven. Now, all right, so, uh, we said Mount Hoy was the most powerful vortex on the planet. It's from here that these 
these imprisoned entities send out their thought forms, their telepathic messages, impelling us to do wrong, to do their bidding, right? But we know with our cell phones, right? So I got my cell phone. If I get too far away from a, 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 an antenna, if I don't get a boost signal, I'm going to drop my call, right? It's the same way, same thing. So they need booster signals. What's their booster antenna? Cities. So this is where this whole, this is where Freemasonry and the design of cities come in. First place where this science was dropped was Babel, Tower of Babel. Confusion of the tongue set man against man, right? Where do they build their cities? On our mounds. Why? Because this is the remember we said the original zero zero reference point is where Mount Hoya is, right? All ley lines and grids come out from there. So if I want to find a ley line, I don't need to chart all the way to Mount Ruizori. All I got to do is find where did the indigenous mark the ley lines. And we mark them with maps. So this is where Babylon builds their cities, OK? And, they, and it's all about occupying the, the world, world uh, global mount matrix, all right? This thing goes back to Rome. If we remember the story of Rome, Romulus wanted to build his, the city around the Palatine Hill. His brother Remus wanted to build it around the Capitoline Hill, right? They fought. Romulus won, and the Palatine Hill was chosen. That's telling you, it's all about occupying the mounds. Now, Rome is called, the, the poetic name of Rome is Cincinnati. The poetic name for the city of Rome is Cincinnati, the city of seven hills. And how Rome got that name was because the Sabines, were the original inhabitants of what is now the area of Rome. And they had several mounds throughout the whole area. And what Romulus did was level all but seven. The mounds that were leveled, they used to fill in the rivers and the creeks and the streams of that area to make it an urban landscape. And they left seven hills, all right? Same thing happened in Philadelphia in 1854 organized through the Philadelphia Waterworks. When, because you know, originally it was just Penn's Philadelphia, which is like center city, and it was nine boroughs. They all became one in 1854. And when that happened, the Philadelphia Waterworks filled in the Aramingo, the Wingahawken, the Nanganesi Creeks, and streams. And they did it by knocking down all of the mounds that were throughout the city, leaving seven. And the seven that they left, they built water works upon. Okay? The layout is in the, const the, the shape of the constellation of the Little Dipper, also known as Ursa Minor, also known as the Wolf. And Romulus and Re Remus were suckled by, by the She Wolf. Okay? I'm kind of moving fast because I, I feel Bob like, dang, I told you in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, let me, I'm, I, am, I am wrapping it up, brother. No, no, you're good. I'm good? Good. <laughs> All right. If we have people late, we'll stop. Yeah. 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 All right, so, society of Cincinnati. Said this thing about, remember we said ultimately this was all about resurrecting Rome, right? So now we're coming back to the Ben Franklin Parkway, which is prop this this statue right here. I'm sorry the resolution isn't that great. Go see it live. This is. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Steve Copeland. Who was someone who uh, 
was about dropping the tapes and naming the names. So in the early 90s, I had, I had the opportunity of inviting Steve Cokie to come and speak in, in Philadelphia. And uh, when it was over, we were like, you know, anything we could do for you before you leave, right? He was a very paranoid dude, right? He wouldn't, he wouldn't take water from us, he wouldn't shake our hands, you know? He's like, there's only one thing I want you to do. I want you to take me to the Ben Franklin equestrian statue at Eakins Oval. Wow. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, we took him there, and we got there, and we just looked like nobody could decipher nothing. I was new to the city myself, right? Couldn't decipher nothing. And it took me a long time to figure out why he said that, okay? But I, I, think I, I think I got some clues to it now, all right? And one of them is the, these biggest clues is what's the, the only thing inscribed on This statue, the George Washington Equestrian statue, was erected by the State Society of the Cincinnati of Pennsylvania. Wow. And uh, the Society of the Cincinnati, what is that? Well... Oh, but before we even get into that, what, now this statue is deep on many levels, but the deepest mystery that it reveals is the conspiracy to assassinate the queen goddess Winona, the wife of Chief Tammany. We know Chief Tammany is, is who signed Penn Pen Treaty. Chief Tammany is the patron saint of the United States. I don't know if y'all knew that. Chief Tammany, the man who signed Penn Treaty, is considered the patron saint of the United States. And it's because he... Remember we talked about Fairmount the most sacred mound of Lenape. The tradition is, they say that this mound, this land, Penn's Philadelphia, is so sacred. Whatever is done on that land is done with the full participation of the earth. So when Chief Tammany signed, quote unquote, signed Penn Treaty, he did so with the full participation of the earth. And it earned the United States providence because even God and nature had to honor the agreement. But the Napi society was matriarchal. It was the grandmothers. Any land being exchanged, grandmothers had to sign off on that thing. And to set up Penn Treaty, they had to assassinate the queen goddess Winona, the leader of the grandmother clan. And that is what the equestrian statue of George Washington memorializes. Okay? So here you have a cop. Here's the queen goddess. Okay? When you, when you go and see it yourself, you'll know she's Lenape. Because when you look at her clothing, it's indigenous pattern. Okay? She's depicted as Greco-Roman goddess, because she was a goddess. Chief Tammany's name meant easy to talk to. And when they asked Chief, why, why are you so easy to talk to? He said, I had intercourse with a divine being. <laughs> so she, you know, she was a goddess. All right? But uh, so they depict her as Greco-Roman in her face. You know she's indigenous when you look at her clothing. Here's a colonist approaching her. He's tipping his hat, but he's got a cloak dagger in one hand. Here's another vision. Cloak dagger. Here's the queen goddess. The other Lenape there 
standing down. They're not on. They're not on post. And where's Ben Franklin in all of this? Everybody else is looking towards the assassination. Ben Franklin's like this, looking away. Again, he was the covert operative. Okay? But now, this society of Cincinnati and Pennsylvania, it's, most people think, because this nation is quote unquote a democracy, that there's nothing inherited there's nothing that you get because of your ancestry associated with this country. Wrong. Because the society of Cincinnati, this is the open, in your face, in public, accounting of the bloodlines and who gets what in this country. Okay? And it was found, it's hereditary members. This is, this is their words. Hereditary members of the Society of Cincinnati are qualified male descendants of commissioned officers who served in the Continental Army or Navy and their French counterparts. So all of those English and French families who worked overtly and covertly to found this nation their descendants by birthright in the society to Cincinnati run the show. And I'm going to tell you how those that are local, I'm going to show you how you see their hand. Uh, the Barnes Foundation. How they violated this man's will. Move his, his, his art collection from out in Westchester where he had it and said, you know, on his, like, his will, like, it's going to stay here and be a permanent collection out here. They got that will violated and moved to the Ben Franklin Parkway. Okay? All right, so y'all know those bloodlines. I don't have to go into that. What does this all mean? I'm going to wrap it up, bro. What does it all mean? Well, it gives a whole new meaning to this cat coming in September. It gives a whole new meaning. Because he's not just coming to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, he's coming to the gates of hell. And then, yeah, and, and right, the guy says September 15th, something's gonna jump off. Didn't he say that yesterday? Whole new meaning to this guy coming. But it does say the conduit is closing. The conduit is closing. Okay? So what does that mean? And it all and they also told us, believe there is good out there. So what I think, I think the the the, the false alien invasion. It's really all about these demons masquerading as aliens. The ones attempting to do us harm are not coming from the heavens. They're, they're the ones that are imprisoned in the earth and they're trying to make a prison break. They're trying to escape their judgment. They're trying to escape their prison and they're manipulating us. Doing a pretty good job of it on this timeline, right? And uh, those coming from the heavens are really coming to help and save us. And this whole false flag invasion is an attempt to get us to fight those who are coming from the heavens to help us out. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So right. Here, here. The Free Your Mind team, December 27th, no, 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 captured no, no. Mark Passio and his crew down in South Philly, captured the fleet of the Ofan, and, and, and he not to be called the Ofan, the Ofan. Uh, no, 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 they caught them uh, above Philly. So when, when I, uh, y'all can, uh, YouTube it is probably on Mark's Facebook. Oh, he has 
It's on his website. So when I saw this, I was like, oh great. The Ophan are coming to close the gates of heaven. But then I got a meditation. It was like, nah. The gates of hell is a human mental projection. The gates of hell are a human mental projection. Whether it's Ben Franklin as the thinker, or those who study Montauk, and they, we know they need a chair. They need a human giving a mental projection for them to travel through space, through those portals of space time, right? So this is a mental projection. The gates of hell is ultimately a mental projection from humans. So we have to put out counter mental projections to close the gate of hell. The Ophan is not going to do it by themselves. Right? So, amplified thought. Meaning, you got a crystal, you got a pyramid, you got a wand, you're standing on a mound or a vortex. You have something to amplify your thought. <coughs> this conference, and right, collective, coming in a collective. Many strong minds coming together and say, conduit closed. Not conduit closing, conduit closed. Okay, we do that, work in conjunction with the whole town. We gotta spread this message. Do not believe there is good out there. You know, so that when they make their move, one, one of the reasons I feel like they haven't made a move yet is because not enough of us know that they're coming to, they're coming with goodness. And they don't want fear, knee-jerk reaction, and we hurt ourselves. We can't hurt them. <laughs> yes, I. So... <laughs> We come together, do these works, the conduit will be closed. Thank you for the extra time, brother. Yeah.